so let's begin. Uh, we were um, uh, talking about Amdahl's law at the end of last class. Uh, basically, um, what the slide says, which says something very intuitive. It says that there are lots of things that you want to do and something is going to be slow no matter what. Then overall things are limited in terms of how fast they can be. Okay? Um, and we looked at a couple of graphs or a few graphs. Um, now what so th this was all basically part of introduction to some sense. And, and uh, we are now moving into uh, getting a sense of what parallel architecture is like today, as well as it uh, has been like for the past few years in terms of uh, uh, high performance, large scale parallel computers, okay? So the components that we will have to understand and be familiar with, comfortable with, uh, are of course that they will have processors, uh, they will have memory, either, and, and usually both, processors will have their own memory, private memory, as well as shared memory that every processor, or at least some of the processors see, and the communication between them. All right. Sometimes this communication will be purely through memory, you write data, to memory when you want to send it to some other processor and that processor reads it from memory. At other times, it will be through some interconnect, direct wire or some switch or some network uh, that um, will take you from one processor to the other. So all of that is the general components of, of uh, they, these are also components of co computation. Right? Processor and memory are required and as long as there is two things, two things being only processor and memory, there is going to be an interconnect. Connecting, otherwise, if memory is not connected to processor, then you can't do much, okay? And so there's nothing new there, except we're going to be uh, looking at this at a slightly expanded level, so to speak. Um, and uh, then there is control. And this is the part that in many ways is different from sequential computation that what is the overall combined control of these many processors? Is there one central processor that says everybody execute one instruction now? Or is it completely distributed? Or is it somewhere in between? Okay. And uh, one common way to classify this control is what is known as Flynn's taxonomy. Okay. So there are four uh, classes in which Flynn uh, divided uh, parallel computation architectures, which is based on how the instruction operates on data in the context of many processors being uh, used to operate these instructions and operate on the set data, okay? So um, in this, you'll, you basically you see two axes. One is how many different sections of data, how many different types of data, how many different blocks of data, modules of data, whatever, how, how many different items of data are being processed. And on the vertical axis, you see instruction, okay? Which is how many different instructions are being processed together, concurrently, maybe in the same clock. And uh, so there are these four categories that will automatically fall out, uh, and they're uh, listed as SISD, which is single instruction, single data. Any clock, you execute one, instruction on one piece of data. Meaning that the, in, in the instruction there are operands, there may be two operands, right? You are maybe adding two things to generate a third result, okay? So there are three operands in some sense, but they're not three pieces of data, they're kind of together, the data that relates to this instruction. Okay, so in that sense, all the sequential <coughs> computation is single instruction, single data. At one time, you're executing one instruction on one piece of data. Okay, the other is uh, single instruction multiple data. Meaning that you are, instruction, you are instructing the computer to do this, but do this on a whole array of things. Okay, so again, you can say add these two numbers to produce the result, but it's the same instruction add, but there is an array of numbers, and the first two are being added to produce the first result, 
second two are being added to produce the second result and so on. Okay. So there is this is data parallelism. Same instruction on lots of data being uh, uh, applied at, at the same clock or not is, is not critical, but let's uh, just say same clock. It just means concurrently together. We will study some architecture that uses the SIMD uh, instruction style and the other which would be the more generic would be MIMD, right? Multiple instructions on multiple data, meaning I've got a number of processors, everybody has its own piece of data, everybody is running its own instruction on its own piece of data and that's the most generic type of architecture, okay? And then there is the, the fourth which is in fact the least used of all three, um, if at all, because people uh, generally do that more in research systems than on commercial ones, which is multiple instruction, single data, MIST. Uh, basically, it's one piece of data that everybody is reading. They're all doing some other different things on that piece of data, okay? And it, it typically works in a pipeline sense that you're generating more results that are going to be used by the earlier things in the pipeline, but on the same piece of data, okay? For example, if I have, uh, as you explained, MIST, multiple processors are uh, computing on the same data, but for example, there are instructions, uh, there are multiple instructions which occur in a single step, like uh, add and uh, move. So, Shouldn't that also be counted under the, in this category, multiple? Multiple instruction, single data. Yeah. Um, but that you could, right? So MISD is more of a something that's hidden in other architectures, but you don't really see an architecture that is based on running multiple instructions on one data and then taking the next piece of data and running many instructions on that piece of data, okay? Um, so it is possible that once in a while, you're going to do multiple things on the same data, but and, and, and an architecture may be designed for that, in which case you'll just say one piece of data and then you do all those things. But typically architectures are not designed for that, meaning that it takes that piece of data, give it to, gives it to that stage or in unit, then again a replica of that piece of data is being given to another stage and another unit to do something else on it. Okay. So it's not exactly multiple instructions, single data. When we say single instruction, we don't take into account pipeline. Um, so pipeline is somewhat hidden in all of these. So once we get into some more detail, which we will shortly, um, these days there is nothing that is not pipeline. Okay. Um, so when when I say sing, that's why I was hesitant to say multi doing this instruction on multiple data at the same clock because at the same clock is not very well defined uh, in unless you set up a context, not very well defined in the context of pipeline, right? So you might say that I've got a pipeline and I'm going to start, start instructions into the pipeline every clock. And then you might mean to say that every uh, clock, I'm going to start one instruction on many pieces of data. And then next clock, I'll start a next instruction on many pieces of data while the previous instruction is still going through the pipeline, okay? Um, we will look in more detail uh, at the SIMD, SIMD and MIMD. Um, these days, and in fact, when we start to look at high performance compu computers of today and the top 500 uh, HPC computers, um, you'll see that they are some mix of SIMD and MIMD. Right? There are lots of SIMD units which, with respect to each other, work in MIMD fashion. And uh, so those two starred um, sections are the ones that we will talk in more detail about, which are the ones that are more popular. Um, SIMD is going to, why not just do MIMD? Right? MIMD is most powerful. Right? You have the freedom to do multiple instructions, to execute different instructions at the same time. Uh, if you wanted for some reason your program to be in a SIMD fashion, just make all the instructions the same, right? 
But the thing is that because you have, you know that there is only one instruction that all the data is going to be applied uh, or is, is going uh, to, uh, the instruction is going to be applied on the data. You know that you're going to fetch only one instruction, need only one program counter, need basically one uh, control state of the machine, which says that I'm going to uh, fetch this instruction, decode this in instruction, and then there are these multiple execution units, okay? Um, something uh, which is a little bit more clear in this diagram. Um, there would be a bunch of execution units, each being able to add, okay? Or subtract or multiply, whatever the instruction says. Um, each having its own registers, and typically those registers will all be called R1 to Rn, okay? So everybody knows its own R1. And the instruction says, add R1 and R2 and store the result in R1. Okay, so everybody has its own notion of R1. Everybody is going to take that R, its own notion of R2 also. Everybody is going to take the R2 data, add it to the R1 data. Okay. Um, so the things that are replicated are the register files and these execution units, but not all of the control that goes with it. As a result of which, it is able to uh, take less area. As a result, it's going to cost less. Uh, it also is more power efficient right? because there's less of replicated control doing the same thing or even doing different things. Uh, there's only one piece of control that's doing it. However, not every application is going to be able to be fit in this single instruction running on multiple data. Uh, and so there are trade-offs. And that's why you don't see these, although there have been cases where the entire machine was simply. But in, in the machines of today, you'll see their SIMD units so that there are small components that may fit this model, but then the entire application might not fit in this model. So you, you break it into components that each fit well, and then you provide each of these components to one SIMD unit, one SIMD engine, okay? Um, the other thing that, and, and because we will be doing programming on SIMD engines, uh, it's uh, important to understand right from the beginning, is that every clock, every execution unit is applying the same instruction. And so if I have a program that has a condition, right, it says if this condition happens, then do that thing, everybody is going to evaluate the condition on their local piece of data. Right? The instruction says evaluate this condition. For example, if B1 is less than B2, then everybody has its B1, B2 pair. And so some places B1 will be less than B2, some places B1 will not be less than B2. And so only those places where B1 is less than B2 should L be assigned the value of R, okay? And so in every SIMD engine, there will be some kind of a conditional disable of these execution units, okay? So when Somebody says, everybody is doing this instruction in parallel. That means every active processor is doing this instruction in parallel. The other inactive ones just don't, it's, they can't execute some other instruction. They just don't execute. That also means that if I have an, if this is true, do A. Otherwise, else, do B. What happens? So some places, it will be true. On some other processors, it will be false. And so first, wherever is false becomes inactive, and everybody executes the instructions of A. And then everybody executes the instruction of B with the first set being inactive and the second set becoming active. OK? So although it would be that if A had 10 instructions and B had 10 instructions, and every processor is running either A or B, every processor is running just 10 instructions, you're going to take 20 clocks. Right? Because when, wherever the condition was true, in set of instructions, which is A, is happening, the other processors are idle, okay? So in SIMD programming, one of the mo uh, more important things to consider is how to make SIMD 
be somewhat condition free okay and often if there is a condition try to organize your simd into groups of work units where the conditions are likely to evaluate to either all true or all false okay it's not that if nobody is setting it to false you still have to spend that 10 clocks with nobody doing anything right that optimization is there so if nobody is active then you don't have to do it all right um so that's the control structure let's get a little into the interconnection so the data which is independent the data part they will be operating on different units yes so the instruction is different in that sense that the place where it goes data from is so what does the instruction look like there is an op code and there is an operand code okay so the operand code says register 1 register 2 register 3 and the op code says add okay so everybody has a local notion of r1 r2 r3 in which different piece of data uh, sits okay the uh, other thing that has to be there in a simd machine is when you load something from memory then you have to have an index load so you say load from this address plus some offset and my offset is 0 this guy's offset is 1 that guy's offset is 15 so they are all loading different pieces of data into their own respective r1s this uh, the memory architecture like uh, the interconnect so this is a memory uh, memory and processor interconnect that you are talking about memory as well as processor okay so we we are going to talk about generic level so we are all on the same page in terms of the terminology in terms of understanding the basic organization of a parallel computer yeah, but, but if everybody starts talking to the memory at the same time will not want it uh, as some model let's say that depends right if there is a full cross bar where n people can talk to n things together then it can be done okay there are technologies where that is it's expensive and people don't implement large cross bars for the reason but we'll we'll talk about it it has to be that if you uh, want to uh, get the full benefit of the uh, this sd architecture every memory access will be the same for all of them unless it is in a if or else loop right if if or else condition so if there is an offset register then they'll all be having different offsets if you say here is a base address and here is the offset register then the offset register will have some data which may be completely different from all of them so it's not necessarily true that they all be reading from neighboring or contiguous chunks of memory okay and there there are several hidden details there right depends on the atom size how much of a data you read from the memory cache line size there are lots of details that uh, we're not getting into at the moment and then when you say that uh, during the condition that some process is idle So how uh, so who who will introduce the instruction for no operating? Um, that's built into the architecture. That uh, so there are instruction sets where you can physically set. Right? You can provide a bit index or a bit array of these conditions, which say you are active, you are active, you are inactive. Okay, uh, but the architecture execution unit will automatically uh, ins- allow you to set somebody inactive. okay so now the compiler says if this evaluates to true set yourself active and then do this and then toggle your active bit and then do this okay so lot of lots of the time we don't know that at compile time no no compiler only in inserts these instructions this is not known at the compile time okay the instruction says that if this evaluates to set to active okay um so there are instructions where you say load an address and a register okay where some multiple times the register multiple typically the word width is added to the base address to get the final address from where to load how was it mentioned for each unit of that so everybody so it's the same instruction so an instruction might look like this where it says load into r0 the contents of this base address plus the contents of r1 
times 4. Okay. Um, now, everybody has an R0. Everybody sees the same base address because it's part of the instruction. This instruction is the same. Everybody has an R1. Okay. Content of that R1 is different from for different. How is that? So, basically, it's a recursive problem. So, what's the base case? For R1's values? Because in the beginning, you set R, R1 to 0. Okay. Everybody loaded um, base address plus their index. Okay. So, somebody has loaded, uh, let's say R1 was equal to 0. Everybody has loaded that address plus 0, plus 1, plus 2, plus 3, all the way up to processor number 15, let's say. Now, they have loaded from different pieces of memory, so they have different pieces of data in R0. Right? And now you again say load R2, 0x, b, c, d, a, R0. Now, R0 has different pieces of data for different compute, different processors. And so, R2 will be loaded from disparate locations in memory. instruction which depends upon the processor load. No, all of them do, right? Even this, so you, you, this is the base, right? You are, so this is the base address. R0 times some child is going to be added, right? Plus, in fact, I can put it right here, plus the processor number. These SIMT instructions, so these instructions are typically the same instruction set as that of the processor it is meant to execute yes. with? Yes, yes, yes. Are there special instruction sets for the SIMT machines? What do you mean special? SIMT machine has a control unit and execution units, right? So like, uh, let's say that I designed SIMT to work with a x86 machine or something like that. So, so uh, by, by the way, uh, since uh, this is also a topic where we are going to move on, to interconnect, uh, we're going to officially take the break now. Continue this discussion, and uh, then uh, uh, move on to interconnect after the break. Okay. Um, yeah, so basically, is the uh, SMT instruction set the same as the X86 or whatever? Uh, it can be. It can be. Um, typically, SMT instruction set will be more or less x86, maybe a few things that are hard to do taken away, but a few things added just to support the SIMD type because there will not be a get my processor ID. So there will typically be um, some instruction like, uh, since I've already used R0, let me make it R2 or R3, R8, and some processor, uh, uh, some instruction set may mandate that R0 is your processor ID, okay? So it's hardwired. Whenever you read R0, you get 0, 1, 2, or 3, okay? And then um, if you want something to depend on your processor ID, you would simply read R0 into some other, so R0 is not a real register, it's some hardwired set of things. And then you put that R0 into another register and then use it. So reading of R0 means getting processor ID wouldn't make sense on x86, but things of that sort would be added into SIMD. So, since they are having a formal base and the axis is depending on this formula, then the memory layout has to be specific to this formula? Memory layout has nothing to do with the this. The data has, been, has to be organized in this particular formula. That's up to you, right? You you read from the place where you, you write. So they are distributed across and how does this formula work? I mean, each one has to have a different way of picking up data from different places. Not a different way. Each one is basically saying, I want to read from some address. Then each one has to load base address. No, no, no. This is part of the instruction, right? So this is not different. Uh, it's the offset that is different. In fact, I am um, probably overextending by saying that some processor number is going to get added, right? Um, typically, a, a SIMD designer will dispense with that by saying you add to R0 your processor number or R8. Before you do this, add R0 to R8. Otherwise, 
will all read the same thing. So you have offset calculation is individual. Offset computation, it's not individual, right? It's an execution unit that's determining the offset. And the way it determines the offset is reading the content of its R8, multiplying by the known stride, and adding the base which is part of the instruction. But in this case, if you add, if you set R1 to 0, then why is R8 going to be different for different processes? Set R1 to 0 here? Yeah. No, then it wouldn't be. Then it would be. No. So if, if, if you set move R1, R0, where R0 is understood to be your process ID, processor ID, then they will be different. So it's like something like map reduce it. You have the same function for the reduce thing, but the mappers give different data to the reduce. Um, map reduce has a big element of SIMD there, yes. Okay, but then that is more of a programming model, uh, and underlying it, you may or may not have a SIMD. Okay. So this will the I'm assuming here it's shared memory, right? If it's a private memory to processors, then everybody has their own copies of data. Then, then everybody will have their own copy, and it would make sense, even when you are reading the same thing, they're actually reading different memory items. Okay. Um, of course, it sometimes makes sense to read the same thing because you want to broadcast some value to every processor. So everybody's reading from the same address. That's reasonable to do. So um, now we are going to move on to uh, talking about interconnects, the types of interconnects that are uh, have been or are in common usage. Um, in general, we'll divide them into two categories. Uh, one is the direct connection where you have a port to which a wire is connected and that wire directly leads to another port to which another processor is connected. So it's you are connected to that processor or you are not. Okay, So the picture on the left hand side, you see P0 is connected to P1 and P5 is not connected to P2. That means P0 cannot send data to P2 unless there is some protocol where P5 can get from P0 and decide that it is to be forwarded and so on. But as far as the instruction set is concerned, you've got three addresses to which you can send a piece of data. All right, so that's a direct connection. Um, P stands for processors or P here stands for processors, right. Um, you can also think of it as another memory, okay, uh, which what I have not drawn. Sorry? What does the instruction look like? Uh, what do you mean by sending it to a processor? Meaning that you, you, their instruction, this typically has a much wider instruction set than x86 type architecture, where you will say, send, send so many bytes from this address to processor number 6, or your port number 3. This address means the memory address. Memory address. Which is local to that particular processor. Yes. Right. Um, memory may also sit uh, uh, memory that is addressable as a node may also sit somewhere okay and then you have to say then the protocol must exist for you to not just say send this piece of data to that processor but send this piece of data to that processor to be stored at that location so does the processor need to be listening uh, at that point data? so now that that's again part of architecture right now there will be some buffering involved which will take that data from the program application and will at a convenient time send that data across. Okay. And so once we get to programming <coughs> model, we have to look at, we will look at the different issues involved with when you send data, how do you know it has received, been received and so on and so forth. Uh, the other on the right hand side is the indirect network where there are non-recipients, so to speak, in the middle, right, the switches, where you say, I want to send some piece of information to some address, and the switches will determine you are connected to one switch, or maybe even more than one, 
and you send to one of your switches and that switch will determine using some routing protocol how to get that data, right? So the inter internet uh, is not direct network. Um, in terms of the different topology and, and the topologies will, the, the links themselves um, may be one of various kinds. So topologies in general will uh, be a bus, which is, for example, Ethernet, where lots of nodes um, have bus is going to have lots of ports and different nodes will hook into that bus. Okay. Um, normally in the parallel computer context, there will be an address bus as well as a data bus. You put address onto the address bus and the data comes out from the data bus. Okay. Or you put data into the data bus and address into the data uh, address bus so that this data gets to that place, to the address. But it's not necessary. Right? In Ethernet, there is no separate uh, address bus and uh, separate data bus. It's the same bus on which you say, here is the address, here is the data, there is one block, and people will figure out who it is for and what the data is. Okay. Um, so that is a bus interconnect. Um, typically, data lines would be much wider than the address lines. Um, and the address and data lines can be common, as we were just discussing, for example, in Ethernet. Um, and on the same bus may sit some memory also. Okay. So you can send uh, address, and the address may point to some location in memory, and data will come out from that memory. So there is some memory controller sitting on top of the memory, deciding how to set memory pins uh, values and how to read the values out of memory pins. One question, is this uh, model, uh, are we discuss the, uh, discussing this in the context of uh, MIMP model or is it also? Um, it is not important what the model is. Okay, Both models will typically have some interconnect. All right. So even in SIMD models, in fact, um, if we go back to the SIMD model picture, see there is something that says interconnect to shared memory as well as other processors at the bottom. It may be a bus, it may be direct connection, and there are various architecture that use one or the other. Um, in some architecture, there may be no interconnect to other processors, but there will be an interconnect to the memory, which everybody is going to share. Right? So uh, the interconnect is kind of independent of the organization of the control. All right. Um, the buses would, of course, be easy to implement. Right? You can imagine having a long bus with lots of different ports and you add a processor, it simply hooks into as long as you have a port available, you can simply plug in. Um, but the problem is that because of the protocols that the buses need to run, um, they don't scale very well, especially in terms of performance. Uh, beyond something like a dozen cores, a dozen processing units, right? And Intel architecture uses buses to connect processors to memory. And so they haven't quite scaled beyond um, eight odd processors uh, in, in a single core, in, in a single chip. Um, the other extreme, so the bus is an extreme in the sense that everybody is connected to a common stratum, okay? And whenever you want to send data to anybody else, you say, here, you take, I have one port and I send it to this port and other, the addressee will read it, okay? And there are conflict issues, contention issues. So one of the reasons it's not very scalable is contention. If lots of people are trying to use the same bus and trying to put the data at the same time, and some, some people will have to back off. And then this repeat back off, repeat back off ends up uh, costing you a lot of time. The other extreme is the crossbar. And basically crossbar has P input ports, uh, or rather M input ports, and N output ports. And any one of these M 
can be connected to any one of these M, right? So um, basically, in, in the internals is actually some kind of a cross wires, some vertical one wires going one set of wires going one way, another set of wires going another way, with some switch at the junctions, which either connects those two wires or keeps them apart. All right, and so if you want to send data from certain certain row to certain column, you simply turn that switch on. And that means that will connect this wire to that wire. So whatever this processor puts on that wire is available on that wire, okay? Um, I have shown in this picture P0 to Pm going at the top horizontally and P0 to Pn going at the bottom, uh, going on the side. Uh, typically, it's the same P0 to Pn, okay, same set of processors, which are also on the top side and also on the horizontal side. What that typically means that input output ports are typically all together and the horizontal wires will have connections so that the ports can be made, the pins can be made on one side. Um, what do you think about the scalability of the crossbar? Lots of, area. Lots, of Lots of power, right? Anybody can talk to anybody quickly with not, no interference from other people. Um, unless, of course, the two people want to talk to the same guy, and that guy can listen to only one at a time. But those are minor issues compared to the same stratum being used for everybody. Right? So cost, is, the performance is going to uh, be reasonable, but the cost is going to grow quickly. Okay? It's typically M times N. Um, and so crossbar is also at one extreme and people might implement crossbars but would normally do it in small groups, subsets. Okay, so this subset is everybody connected to everybody. This subset has everybody connected to everybody. And then there is some way to communicate from this subset to that subset. Okay, so that's a hierarchical structure. So we are talking of this cost, this is the running cost or the manufacturing? Is it the power? It's all, right? I'm mainly talking about manufacturing costs, right? But power is a big input into the manufacturing cost. But the, the running power is also high for power. Yes, it is, right? So cost is high. One of the reasons cost is high is that it takes a lot of power. That's not the only reason, but there is a correlation. And so typically there would be some intermediate things like uh, multi-stage, Right. So you may have several stages of, you may have to go through um, this subset can have direct connections from everyone to everybody. So it's like a complete graph. But then you can't talk to anybody in that subset. There will be some representative of that subset. You send data to that. And then that can replace uh, the destination to anybody of its neighborhood. And from there, it can go to the next neighborhood. So these are multi-stage networks are uh, sometimes used. Um, we'll talk about some other also more specialized subsets which lie between the two extremes when we talk about examples of architecture. Um, the other side, when you don't have communication networks directly, or actually even when you do have communication networks, is a shared memory side. Right? So you've got memory. It is either connected through some interconnect to the various processors. Um, well, actually, it is going to be connected through some interconnect to the various processors. It may not be that various processors can talk to each other on the same interconnect. But memory is going to have to have some either a bus, which would make sense, because all the processors um, are only talking to memory, not to each other. And so contention is reduced. Um, so we have to, again, understand that there is this need for caches on the local memories because you don't want to read data from the memory across this interconnect every time you need it. You want to read it in chunks, store it in the cache, and reuse that data from the cache. Okay? Everybody who has done architecture would have seen that um, in great detail. 
And whenever you have these multiple copies of a piece of data, you need to make them consistent with each other. Okay, so the cache coherence is at the programming level, we'll just assume that it exists, right? But at the hardware level, somebody has to spend the effort to provide that cache coherence. Cache coherence means that even though there are these multiple copies of the same data, they are consistent with respect to each other. And this is where the various models of memory consistence, consistency come into play. Okay, and one of the models is serializability. This is the most basic model, which says that when you look at the profile that any memory item is going through, any location in memory is going through, it must match the profile that a sequential execution would go through, where you take any sequential execution. When you take these different set of instructions that the different processors are executing, and execute them in some order. Okay. So you take the uh, 10 instructions for processor 1, uh, 20 instructions for processor 2, 30 instructions for processor 3, 2 instructions for processor 4, and ex execute them, interleave them in any way. You cannot reorder uh, the instructions of any given processor, but between any two processors, these 20 can be anywhere among these 10. Okay. As long as one of those serializations produces the same effect on memory, your memory effect is reasonable. Okay. Um, and one of the bare minimums that is required, this is not sufficient, is required uh, for all programs to be able to guarantee serializability is that there be cache coherence, meaning that when you have the same piece of data at two locations and one of them has to update it, this piece of data cannot be given to that processor. Okay, Because if this piece of data is old and some new data has come in here and this instruction that you are going to uh, execute later on, which depends on something that this instruction has done, which means if it depends on that instruction, it must come after that in any order, in any serialization. If it comes after that, it cannot have seen the old value. Okay, It has to see the updated value that this processor made. And so, there are various protocols um, to guarantee. We are not going to talk about those in any detail. Uh, various protocols that guarantee uh, cache coherence. Uh, but at a high level, you either have to, whenever you update your local copy, you have to make sure that everybody's copy is up to date. And you have to do it in a fashion that they cannot read the old value. right? Or when you update your copy, you invalidate everybody's copy. And again, with the guarantee that they cannot read the old value. Okay, once they're invalidated, whenever they have to read, they'll read it from you rather than through the memory. Okay, and there are lots of different so details. Atomicity of what? Of memory update or access. Yes, because you're only ordering instructions. All right. Um, so with those at the high level concepts that go into architecture. Let's move on uh, to um, the history of uh, parallel computers. And um, we'll look at uh, several of these uh, axes, uh, Flynn's classification, like right? SIMD or MIMD, or a combination. Um, what is the size of processor? What is the granularity? Um, of the processing elements. Uh, there may be lots of very weak processors or a few of very strong processors, uh, very powerful processors. Their address space organization uh, and whether they are shared memory and distributed memory. Okay, And let's begin with the PC of today. Right? It is, uh, we'll, we'll look at some numbers later on, but uh, it is a supercomputer 
from not that long ago. Okay, it's more powerful than supercomputers from not that long ago. Um, and it is a parallel computer. Right? Uh, these days, you cannot buy a single core machine anymore. Um, and so PCs are parallel computers. They'll have all of these notions. Right? They will be either SIMD or MIMD or some combination. They will have some interconnect among the processors, among the processors and the memory. Uh, they may, may not have shared memory and so on and so forth. In this case, they actually do have the shared memory architecture. And then those two pictures are uh, multi-CPU on the top, right? Separate CPU cores, separate CPU units, chips. Um, and the bottom side is multiple cores in the same CPU. <coughs> and then really at the low level, the only difference is a little bit of the organization. Everybody is still connected to the shared memory. Um, the controller to the shared memory talks to one unit um, in the multi-core. Right? There are multiple CPUs, but there's a single controller that is providing data to all the cores. On the um, other side, there is this uh, crossbar through which all these different CPUs are addressing and talking to the memory. And so they all have their own independent units to be able to uh, access a piece of data, to be able to put things on the address bar and reading the data. Uh, so that is one important, the control of the memory. In one case, there is um, essentially one-to-one -one relationship with the CPU and the memory. CPU directly fetches it from the port. In the other case, there are multiple CPUs connected to the memory, through the memory controller, which is doing some arbitration. Can you just briefly repeat your control? So in one case, it's one consumer, which is the CPU, and one producer, which is the memory. Right? And there is direct connection. And it's on the memory, on the consumer side, that there is some arbitration, which is whether that core wanted this data or this core wanted this data. Okay, but as far as the memory is concerned, it sees one stream of data and uh, one memory slash memory controller. Memory always sees one address and one data. Um, but the memory controller sees one connected to it, one CPU connected to it. But on the multi-CPU units, the memory controller sees multiple consumers. And it says, you want this piece of data, you want that piece of data, you want that piece of data. I'm going to have to determine who gets it first. Uh, and the other is the sharing of cache. In multi-cores, there is one cache that, so the memory is feeding into the cache, and then that cache is spreading out the results uh, to whoever wants it. And, and so really these two are not two different separations, it's really the same separation, um, because there is one fetcher from the CPU's point of view for the memory in one case, and that fetcher has to feed it to that one cache. And there are many fetchers, each fetching independent streams of data, somehow being arbitrated by the memory controller. And all these fetchers get their data and put it in their own respective caches. Okay. Um, the bus is the architecture, as I had earlier mentioned of uh, use, because typically there are a small number of processors, okay? Um, one of the earliest parallel computers had this direct connection, direct network, okay? And this is an example of what is often called mesh network or the grid network, where you are connected to two processors on two side, it's a 2D mesh, and two processors on the vertical side. 3D mesh has also been formed where the third axis is also used. And processors are also laid out in that fashion so that these uh, connections are small, the wires are small, okay? Um, mass power is, is one example um, of such a machine which we'll talk about shortly. Um, 
So this is 3D mesh. In some implementations of mesh, you also have some additional wires. Um, so instead of just connecting it along the axes, you also connect it to the diagonals. Um, here is uh, another uh, uh, an example of that, where you're connected diagonally. Um, and so now, and, and although there were other examples like CM, which had a mesh connection, um, mass power, you basic it was SIMD machine. Right? So everybody uh, was executing the same thing at a given time, and they could only talk to their neighbors. Right? So either they were all adding things, adding, subtracting, whatever, or they were saying, send this data to my right-hand neighbor. Okay, And um, it is a little asymmetric if you think about it, right? If everybody says, send the data to my right-hand neighbor, what happens? The last guy either burns out or has some way to inactivate itself. And so it is not uncommon to have the torus uh, connection where the last guy has a connection to the first guy. So the last guy's right-hand neighbor is the guy on that side. Okay? Uh, and similarly uh, on this side. Um, the extension to this is this notion of hypercube, hypercube connection which is, again, somewhere between taking us closer to um, full crossbar connection than bus, but at the same time not incurring the entire cost of it. And uh, hypercube connection is, is, is also, in some ways, generalization of the mesh connection. Um, so hypercube for two nodes is simply a wire connecting node. All right? Hypercube of four nodes is um, wires connecting them in subset of a grid, a mesh. Okay. But three nodes, uh, or rather, uh, since we went from two to four, should go to eight. Uh, and these node sizes typically do go up in orders of powers of two. Um, you get it in the third dimension of the cube, right? So another four, and you connect them like this. If you want more processors, for example, 16, you make another cube and connect them one at a time. You want go to 32, you make another copy of the 16, and then make one one to one connections. So, how many connectors will each node have? Log of n, right? For n nodes, each connector will have log of n. Okay. And uh, some of the things we look for when we are making connections are um, how far are other nodes from any given node. Okay, so the distance between two furthest nodes is called the diameter of the network. Meaning that it's going to take that many hops to get data from one of the nodes to the other. Assume the size of each node. It may not be possible to place them so that every hop is actually possible, right? If lots of people were, are talk, wanting to talk to lots of other people, is that? If we want to place 32 cores in this fashion, we cannot keep all these hops of equal distance. No, no, of course not, right? In fact, already here, you have some hops of distance one, some hops of distance two. No, no, I'm saying we have two hops from for the liner element, but each a single step is actually of some distance. That distance actually in some increasing as we That distance is, is typically symmetric. Okay. Um, or at least in terms of performance evaluation, we consider them to be symmetric. The length of wires will not be the same. It depends on a very complex layout pattern, right? But it is not going to affect the speed of computation by a lot, right? Because Signal travels very close to the speed of light. Okay, so making that one centimeter extra is not going to make any difference. 
it's the buffers and the, the delays that are uh, caused because of the control structure that makes the difference, okay? And so, um, and for all practical purposes, these are one cost hops or, or uniform single cost hops. Okay, um, the next would be the tree network. Uh, by the way, I, I was telling you about um, the parameters for interconnects. One is, of course, the diameter. What is the maximum time it might take from node A communicating to node B? The other is the separation. It's also called the bisection cost. How many wires would you have to cut to separate it into two units? Meaning that now this set of processors have no path to that set of processors. You mean the atomic model of India? Atomic model of? I'm not even going to get into models of failure, uh, but that failure is the reason this cost is often used. Okay, um, but uh, failures of uh, failure models are not necessarily atomic. Okay. Um, before we talk about the tree, let's take another break.